So Georgia O'Keeffe was born in 1887. Um, and she insisted that her floral paintings were not intentionally vaginal, so, you know? Um, and, and that kind of makes sense. She distanced herself from second wave feminists who championed her work as sex positive celebrations of female sexuality and what we might call vagina power today. That everybody's familiar with that term. Um, and so I wanna, what I want to talk about is how second wave feminist art and politics, because there's a lot of like theory underneath the art movement too, and I don't know that much about the visual art movement. Um, have shaped our interpretations of O'Keeffe's work. So I'm going to start with this image of the dinner party. This is pretty famous, so many of you have probably seen it. It's an installation piece by Judy Chicago from 1979. That would have been kind of at the height of radical feminism. And uh, she created uh, 39 place settings for historical and mythical women, and one of them was devoted to Georgia O'Keeffe. And what do you think? Did she make her interpretation of O'Keeffe's work clear here? Okay, uh, so did she out vagina O'Keefe with this <laughs> three dimensional sort of? Uh, um, okay. Um, and so it, with this piece, she sort of symbolically invites O'Keefe to join second wave feminists. It's like, have a seat at our table, join us. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the second wave. <laughs> um, so while O'Keeffe rejected Freudian interpretations of her flowers as yonic, I love that word, it means it's sort of like a spiritual version of or opposite, it's a spiritual antonym of the word phallic. It means vagina-like, but it has a spiritual sort of connotation. Um, 1970s feminists exalted her flowers as icons of female sexuality and sexual agency. So during this period, feminist artists began to take back the vagina. Because there are lots of vaginas in art, right? and the crusty old paintings from like going all the way back to the Renaissance and before. Um, but they started thinking about presenting them from an empowering perspective, moving away from a phallocentric nude tradition. So that's a cool word that you can use at lunch today. Um, anybody? Phallocentric? What would it literally mean? Dana? <laughs> Sorry, Dana was in my class once, so <laughs> years ago. Penis-centered, but male-centered, so, um, and uh, to a sort of uh, moving into a vulva-inspired art that explored the female sexuality from a gynocentric, and that actually means woman-centered uh, perspective. Um, so this is a work, this is a translation of the original title by a French artist. It's called She a Cathedral, and so what's going on here? What is the cathedral? I think it would be the womb, right? And people are like going in and out of the vagina into the womb. Um, and so this is from 1966. Um, so this would have been when the feminist movement was, was gearing up and this artist was French, so they were probably a little bit ahead of Americans in their radicalness. Is that true, Sally Boyd? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, um, so before I go into um, women's art and how they sort of, uh, and, and the politics behind it, I wanted to talk a little bit about this theory of the gaze. Wow, that yellow is not very visible from where I'm standing, but I can turn around. Um, so there was this essay that came out in 1975 called Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, and it was by a theorist named Laura Mulvey, and she was interested in film and the ways that film presents women. And she actually owes a lot to a guy named John Berger who wrote this book called Ways of Seeing that was all about how art, um, the entire Western tradition, presents women. And she explored this thing called the gaze, particularly the male gaze, in this chapter called Woman as Image, Man as Bearer of the Look. And it's all about the ways that men in cinema are positioned as the central consciousness or the center of the work, the ego ideal, the person we identify with, and that women are presented as peripheral and often erotic objects to be consumed, flaunted, uh, whatever. Um, and so this applies to mainstream cinema. And I really love this. Uh, flyer here that was created by Guerrilla Girls, which is actually a third wave group. Um, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Um, and this was from 2011, I think. Less than 4% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 76% of the nudes are female. And so I've got two famous uh, pieces here. The first one is called Reclining Bacante, and it really establishes uh, the male gaze, because you've got the nude, lying back here and uh, some creepy dude looking through a window. And so I think that guy is like a stand-in for the artist, but also the viewer, right? And even if you're female, um, you know, or even if you're like a gay man, 
um, whatever your position is, your sexual orientation or your gender identity, you're still sort of invited to look from that perspective. And then this other, uh, this is a pretty famous vagina um, that has no person attached to it. That's kind of interesting, and it's called The Origin of the World. Pretty heavy, right? So that's interesting. And it's, it's really weird in that gilded frame. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, so the second wave wanted to sort of take back the vagina, but they wanted to present it from a gynocentric point of view. And so there were a number of artists that played around with this imagery. And Hannah Wilk would be a, a pretty well-known one. These are terracotta vaginas, and it's called Sweet 16. So I guess it's 16 vaginas sitting there on a white background. Very pretty. Um, any observations on this? How do these differ from the vagina that we saw in the image uh, before that was created by a male artist? It is, it is, it's, it's more abstract, right? Um, and so by abstracting it, what do you suppose this artist was trying to do, perhaps? Not that I know, because I'm, oops, I forgot to turn my phone off. No one ever calls me, though, so. Um, perhaps uh, sort of upholding it as more of a concept, an abstraction. You know, uh, you can think about its political importance, its abstract beauty, um, its, its essence, nature, all that stuff. So that's pretty interesting. Oh, the color, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. So it's pink. So you would say symbolically or yeah. anatomically? OK. OK, good. Um, so now I'm going to talk about second wave vagina politics. <clears throat> and all of the issues that were going on in the second wave, not all of them, but some of them, because we don't have time for all of them, um, <clears throat> that were informing these artists and, and where these ideas come from and where, what they were working against. And this is actually a contemporary piece called Clay Teeth Monsters. Does it remind anyone of anything? Is someone going to say the vagina dentata? Just like this, this ancient myth, this idea of the, the vagina with teeth that goes all the way back to like before Greek culture, I think, and this idea that um, the vagina could be something dangerous and mysterious that would castrate men. And there's even one cute little uh, folkloric story about a guy who goes in and defangs the vagina monster. I can't remember what tradition that's from, but you can Google it and find out. OK, so a lot of our damaging ideas about <laughs> female sexuality come from this guy. Anybody recognize? <laughs> yeah, so OK, so that's, that's our friend Freud. Um, and he came out with this essay called Three Essays on Sexuality in 1905. But what's interesting about it is this is a very early sort of examination of sexuality. But his ideas stuck around until the 60s. And I think they're still somewhat um, upheld today, even. I mean, they're still with us. His legacy is still with us. So he's got three theories here that, I, um, that second wave feminists were really working against and trying to um, sometimes working with but sort of twisting it into their own thing. There's even a, a form of psychoanalysis called feminist psychoanalysis. So um, the first one, penis envy, is the most well-known, I think. Anybody know what that is? You don't have to talk. I just, I thought it would be fun. Anybody, penis envy? You know. You're just being stubborn. Um, OK, well. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, but, it, but, but it's interesting that it's not just that women wanted a penis, but Freud basically described women as castrated males. That's what we are, castrated males. And so the only way to get over your penis envy is to do what? Have a baby. And Freud even had a word for it. It was called the penis baby. And imagine it in German, because it was a hyphenated German word, so that made it even more ridiculous. So when a woman got her penis baby, meaning like she had a baby, then she could get over this for the first time. Uh, but she also had to accept her naturally masochistic sexuality. So what does that mean? Women invite <laughs> pain, <laughs> not necessarily uh, physical pain, but psychological pain. And so they're born to be passive and dominated. And part of this was accepting their passive nature. And so experiencing this thing that, that uh, was called the vaginal orgasm. And so Freud basically said that the clitoris was 
the childish site of female sexuality. And when you grew up, you moved on and forgot all about that thing. And you enjoyed this thing called the vaginal orgasm. And it was best enjoyed in the missionary position, right? Sort of passively accepting your, your female passive masochistic nature, and then you could have this earth-shattering thing called the vaginal orgasm. And a lot of women didn't have these things. Imagine that. And so Freud called them frigid. And psychoanalysts uh, were actually still using that concept right up to the mid-60s. And I think Betty Friedan was an important early critic of Freud. She has a whole chapter taking him down in the feminine mystique. So that was good. Um, so a lot of the vagina politics are based on Freud. Um, there was even an early Freudian called H Karen Horney, and I hate to make too many jokes, but that is a ridiculous name for a Freudian. Uh, but she was a student of Freud's, and she actually attempted to sort of take back the vagina and counteract the idea of penis envy by formulating this idea of womb envy, which is the idea that men really want wombs and that the whole uh, medical industrial complex tries to take over a woman's body by controlling the womb. Um, and that vaginal sensations are what create vaginal orgasms, not castration anxiety. And um, that's what motivates a girl's acceptance of her femininity. So interestingly enough, even though she was kind of working against Freud, she was also sort of helping to popularize his notion of the vaginal orgasm, this earth-shattering thing that you were supposed to experience as a woman, and that if you didn't experience it, there was something wrong with you and you might be frigid. And so even though early sexologists uh, fought against this idea. Um, Anne Cote was an early feminist, or sorry, not an early feminist actually, uh, but she released this pamphlet called The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm that definitely went against it, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Uh, but before I talk about the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s and how it kind of exploded with countercultural discourses that were all about erotic freedom and self-actualization for women, um, there were some important sex manuals that talked about how great the clitoris was. So you've all heard of Alfred Kinsey, right? Everybody knows. OK, uh, so he came out with human sexual behavior, or sexual behavior of the human male in 48, and then the human female in 53. And people were shocked by his declarations that women had premarital sex, that they masturbated, and that they had uh, clitorises, right? And that was sort of the seed of their sexuality. Um, and then in Human Sexual Response, which came out in 66, um, Masters and Johnson actually went into great detail about how the clitoris was the seat of female sexuality. And so they completely refuted F Freud's notion that the clitoris was this uh, sort of childish thing. Wow, I have a big block of text there. It seemed important when I was composing this. Um, but there's some juicy stuff in here. I'll just read through in a dramatic voice, like you're at a poetry reading. Uh, based on observations of over 10,000 orgasms experienced by men and women in pairs and masturbating, wow, that would have been an interesting research scene, uh, this study presents the clitoris as a profoundly complex physiological entity with the primary function of stimulating sexual tensions and the dual capacity as both receptor and transformer. So that means it's like the thing that sort of processes all sexual stimuli and the thing that receives it initially. So uh, this text actually established the clitoris as the homologue of the penis. So it's like women have like a penis too. Um, it's the same tissue. And they even describe it as swelling and elongating and engorging and expanding. And they, I'm actually using words from, from a physiological text. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and so they suggested that a woman's sexual awakening might uh, actually make the phallic component of her reproductive system bigger, like basically that women have phalluses. And um, so that was a big part of uh, people like Freud being afraid of the clitoris maybe, that it's too phallic, it's too much like what the male has, and so they want to sort of efface that. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, also with Masters and Johnson, they talked a lot about women having multiple orgasms and about postmenopausal sexuality, which was really... Um, politically important for women of that time. Um, so the sexologists, I guess you'd describe them, the scientific people who were looking at female sexuality spurred a whole host of feminist texts about female sexuality. So you've got Our Bodies Ourselves, 1970, that was important. Um, and then the Height Report, 
which was based on a lot of surveys about women and their sexuality, and Betty Dodson self-published Liberating Masturbation from 1974. I wonder if our public library still has a copy of that. <laughs> um, but I think one of the most important texts for sort of uh, putting the clitoris at the epicenter of female sexuality was Anne Coates' famous essay, The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm. And it was dis distributed as a mimeographed pamphlet in 1970. And if you were a woman, you could get it for free. And if you were a man, you paid either 50 cents or a dollar. I forget. Um, and it was also anthologized in this text called Radical Feminism in 1973. And it draws on research of Masters and Johnson, not only to diminish Freud's theory, but also to argue that patriarchal society has ignored the sexological science to maintain the hegemony of the penis. What does that mean? That is a hilariously highfalutin concept. It just means the power, penis power. Um, so she's taking down penis power and trying to restore uh, clitoris power. And so she, she basically ignores Masters and Johnson's descriptions of the orgasm as a sort of full body phenomenon that results in vaginal, uterine, and even rectal contractions, and essentially tries to make the vagina like not important at all. She's like, the clitoris is the thing. Um, the vagina is nothing but like a tube, basically. Um, and so she even quotes Kinsey, but she doesn't really go into uh, Masters and Johnson's sort of full exploration of the way that the whole system sort of works together. But she's really important because she's politically rezoning female anatomy here. What does that mean? Can, can somebody talk about that a little bit? She's like, Freud was wrong. The clitoris is important. It's at the epicenter of female sexuality. Um, so this is sort of like making the vagina important, but also the clitoris as part of the vagina, which sort of ties into our, um, our uh, artistic subject for today's um, lecture. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to return back to Georgia O'Keeffe now. Here's an image of hers from 1930, Jack in the Pulpit, number four. Um, so continuing a little bit with uh, Coat uh, and her theory. She said, in fact, the phallic status and penile physiology of the clitoris are precisely the features that make this organ so threatening to masculine hegemony. And she even said that clitoridectomies, where some cultures actually remove the clitoris, is actually fear of this sort of tiny penis that women have. And Freud was attempting to get rid of it conceptually. Another important thing that Coat did is she uh, really uh, made an important move for lesbian sexuality because she pointed out that if you knew how your equipment worked, um, then you can, you don't need, you know, the male penis. That's redundant, I guess. Well, no, it's not because we just talked about how the clitoris is a female penis. Um, that you can actually explore your sexuality by yourself or with other women or whoever. So it opened up a whole range of uh, sexual possibilities. Um, and so I wanted you to think about this sort of political background when we're considering the ways that second wave feminists sort of took Georgia O'Keeffe, who, who might not have been aware of all of these things, and sort of refashioned her art into something that was more about vagina power, but also maybe more about clitoral power, too. Uh, does anybody have any observations about this particular image? Especially people who uh, are familiar with art theory, because I'm not. It looks like a highway. It looks like a, anything else? Well, I always think of, since she protested and said it's not vaginal. OK. Not to sound too Freudian, but I always think that maybe it's subconsciously that she chose to prop the photo. You know, she looked at flowers and propped the photographs. Mm -hmm. And so she was drawn to that. And oh, okay. That's my, I mean, that's just my theory. Yeah, so it's like she was drawn to the deep yonic power yeah. of the vagina without understanding without it herself. Make right, yeah. Because she was at a place in uh, the art realm where she just wanted to be taken seriously yeah. as an artist, yeah. not regarded as a female artist. And 
And feminist art had not really emerged as a concept yet. Um, but so I like that theory. So there's something unconscious. And I think that Freud's uh, idea of the unconscious is very valuable. And feminist uh, psychoanalysts explore that too. So it's like we don't have to reject everything about Freud, but definitely penis envy. Um, any other uh, ideas about? There's just a lot of about the sexual reproductive parts of flowers. Exactly. That, That's similar. That is co common to the, re the reproductive parts of other animals. Yeah, yeah. So if you're drawing close-ups of flower genitalia, it's going to look like other genitalia from the natural world. So that's, that's an interesting point, too. But nevertheless, she was still drawn to like zoom in on these particular parts of the flowers. Uh, so that's interesting, too. Um, so back to O'Keefe again. Um, here's a quote from her. The men like to put me down as the best woman painter. I think I'm one of the best painters. So that was definitely a, a very strong feminist statement there. Um, but it's very different from what was going on in the second wave when women were all about, let's get back to this female form of painting, female forms of writing, uh, the holy vagina, you know, the woman's unconscious, all of this stuff. So it's a very different attitude toward art and toward femininity and toward feminine power and all of that. Um, so, so how do you think her gender politics, I've kind of already talked about that, but how do they differ from those of second wave feminists who highlighted the power of the clitoris? And maybe the world that she lived in, how was it different from what was going on with these women who suddenly want to take O'Keefe and make her into this statement for vagina power and even cl clitoral power, clitoris power? Anybody? Well, she was one of the few famous women artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by linking the movement to her, Mm -hmm. But she's still alive. She was still alive, right. And so she was alive when they attempted to sort of uh, associate her work with the feminist movement. And she was still basically a modernist, you know, in mind. And so, um, and I would say modernists would probably, uh, uh, my approach to modernism is through literature. But they're very into, like, close reading and the piece standing on its own and all of that. And so they would have been probably disturbed by the idea of defining a work with a political context, you know. Um, instead, it speaks for itself. It's like this, this, this holy object that radiates truth um, instead of being something that's, that's defined by politics. Um, so Blue Line is actually here in the museum. Has anyone seen this? Yeah, so, um, and I uh, really enjoyed looking at the, the real thing and seeing the brush strokes and all of that. So any statements about Blue Line based on anything that we've been talking about? Do you think the second wave feminists would have uh, included Blue Line? Because when I was looking at the art that uh, is on display here, I was thinking that this one was probably the most uh, you know, yonic of all of them, um, and probably the second wave feminist would have included this one. Um, anything else you want to say about it? This particular work from an art history perspective or a aesthetic perspective or a feminist perspective? From an art history perspective, it shows the interest in the circle, eternity. Oh, was, OK. You know, I'm still in that, I guess, more you. Oh, yeah, but actually that makes sense because uh, he would have been quite popular as well. And uh, even though Jung had some, some uh, rigid ideas about gender, he was definitely more about female empowerment. And he even had this theory of like the bisexual psyche, that every woman has a man inside and every man has a woman na womanly nature, and that it's there, but society kind of tries to squelch it. And so that's interesting. So the circle is all about the union, so maybe even like a kind of sexual mingling as well. Because that's kind of a, a vaginal and a vaguely testicular image or my off base here. But it's like the eternal, the eternal aspect of it. OK, so here's another one, a uh, gray line with black, blue, and yellow. I invite observations based on what we talked about, about uh, political context for art or aesthetic theory or whatever you like to use to analyze 
All right, and I'm kind of curious about that, actually. 